Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the RH Second Quarter Fiscal 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star and then the number one on your telephone keypad. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your first speaker today, Ms. Allison Malkin. Ma'am, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second quarter fiscal 2021 earnings conference call. Joining me today are Gary Friedman, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Jack Preston, Chief Financial Officer. Before we start, I would like to remind you of our legal disclaimer that we will make certain statements today that are forward-looking within the meaning of the federal securities laws, including statements about the outlook of our business and other matters referenced in our press release issued today. These forward-looking statements involve a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. Please refer to our SEC filings as well as our press release issued today for a more detailed description of the risk factors that may affect our results. Please also note that these forward-looking statements reflect our opinions only as of the date of this call, and we undertake no obligation to revise or publicly release the results of any revision to these forward-looking statements in light of new information or future events. Also, during this call, we may discuss non-GAAP financial measures, which adjust our GAAP results to eliminate the impact of certain items. You will find additional information regarding these non-GAAP financial measures and a reconciliation of these non-GAAP to GAAP measures in today's financial results press release. A live broadcast of this call is also available on the Investor Relations section of our website at ir.rh.com. With that, I'll turn the call over to Gary. Great. Thank you, Allison, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to start with our shareholder letter, and then we'll open the call to questions. To our people, partners, and shareholders, we are pleased to report another quarter of record results with adjusted net revenues increasing 39% to $989 million versus $710 million a year ago, up 40% compared to the second quarter of 2019. RH continues to set a new standard for financial performance in the home furnishings industry, and our results now reflect those of the luxury sector as adjusted operating margin increased to 26.6% versus 21.8% last year. We generated $263 million of adjusted operating income in the quarter, up 70% compared to $155 million a year ago. Adjusted net income increased 105% to 252 million, and adjusted diluted earnings per share reached 848 versus 490 in the second quarter of last year. This year's adjusted net income benefited from an unusually low tax rate of 1.3% versus 16.1% a year ago due to an increase of stock options exercised in the quarter and the nearly 3x increase in our average stock price. If our tax rate in the second quarter was comparable to last year, adjusted diluted earnings per share would have been 721, an increase of 47% versus 490 in the second quarter of 2020. We generated 290 million of adjusted EBITDA in the quarter and 95 million of free cash flow. The second quarter ended with total net debt of 296 million and trailing 12 months adjusted EBITDA of 1 billion a new milestone for RH. While inventory on the balance sheet increased 32% to 646 million, inventory on hand was 400 million, up 12% to last year, as in-transit inventory of 163 million increased 85% to a year ago, compared to a year ago. Raising fiscal 2021 outlook. Based on the continued strength of our business and the power of our operating model, we are once again raising our outlook for fiscal 2021. We now expect revenue growth of 31 to 33% versus our prior outlook of 25 to 
and adjusted operating margin in the range of 24.9% to 25.5% versus our prior outlook of 23.5 to 24.3%. We're also raising our ROIC outlook for the year to 70% versus our prior outlook of 60%. Our demand growth is accelerated during a demand growth has accelerated during the third quarter on a two-year basis and has continued to build momentum despite cycling the most difficult comparisons from a year ago and the continued supply chain challenges that have been amplified by the, by the spread of the Delta variant. We believe the, Delta, we believe the data and current trends support the argument of, of a more long-term sustainable step change in consumer spending on the home. An important point to consider when analyzing the strong demand in the housing market is the migration of consumers to larger suburban and second homes. This trend is resulting in substantial square footage growth that is driving increased furniture and furnishings demand. Add to that historically low interest rates, a record stock market, and the reopening of several large parts of the economy, and elevated spending on the home could very well have a long tail. Looking forward, Several factors lead us to believe fiscal 2022 is shaping up to be the most exciting year on record for the RH brand as we are planning the largest new product cycle in our history, highlighted by the launch of RH Contemporary in the spring of 2022, plus our latest RH interiors and modern source books, which have not been mailed since the spring of 2020. The opening of RH England, the gallery at the historic Einho Park, a magical 73-acre estate designed in 1615 by the legendary English architect, Sir John Soane, that, we'll, that we will introduce RH to the UK in a dramatic and unforgettable fashion. The unveiling of our first RH guest house in New York, a revolutionary new hospitality concept for travelers seeking privacy and luxury in the 200 billion North American hotel market. The launch of the world of RH, a digital portal presenting our integrated ecosystem of products, places, services, and spaces, all designed to elevate the RH brand and communicate our authority as a thought leader, taste, and placemaker. As it relates to the ongoing supply chain challenges, the Vietnamese government recently ordered a shutdown of manufacturing facilities due to the rapid spread of the Delta variant. This began with partial shutdowns in early July and expanded to full factory closures by late July. We are currently expecting manufacturing to restart in Vietnam in October, with production ramping to full capacity by the end of the year. Additionally, suppliers globally continue to, to, continue to experience a number of challenges, including sourcing raw materials, and we are seeing price increases in the, in the majority of our product categories. Shipping also continues to be a headwind with longer transit times and higher transportation costs. As a result of our accelerating demand trends, and compounding supply chain challenges. We are delaying the launch of RH Contemporary until spring of 2022. Additionally, we are pushing out the mailing of our fall source books to enable manufacturing partners to focus on reducing the backlog of core products while ramping and refining production on new collections to meet our elevated quality standards. Based on similar supply chain challenges and uncertainty of how the Delta variant will impact the hospitality industry this winter, We've made the decision to delay the opening of our first New York guest house, our first guest house in New York City until spring of 2022. Our plans to open new design galleries with integrated hospitality in Chicago, Jacksonville, and San Francisco this fall remain intact. The long view, the RH business vision and ecosystem. We believe there are those with taste and no scale and those with scale and no taste. And the idea of scaling taste in large, is large and far-reaching. Our goal to position RH as the arbiter of taste for the home has proven to be both disruptive and lucrative as we continue our quest to build one of the most admired brands in the world. Our brand attracts the leading designers, artisans, and manufacturers, scaling and rendering their work more valuable across our integrated platform, enabling RH to curate the most compelling collection of luxury home products on the planet. Our efforts to elevate and expand our collection will continue with the introduction of RH Contemporary, RH Couture, RH Bespoke, RH Color, RH Antiques and Artifacts, RH Atelier, and other new collections scheduled to launch over the next decade. Our plan to open immersive design galleries in every major market will unlock the value of our vast assortment 
generating revenues of five to six billion in North America and 20 to 25 billion globally. Our strategy is to move the brand beyond curating and selling products to conceptualizing and selling spaces by building an ecosystem of products, places, services, and spaces that establish the RH brand as a global thought leader, taste, and placemaker. Our products are elevated and rendered more valuable by our architecturally inspiring galleries, which are further elevated and rendered more valuable by our interior design services and seamlessly integrated hospitality experience. Our hospitality efforts will continue to elevate the RH brand as we expand beyond the four walls of our galleries into RH guest houses, where our goal is to create a new market for travelers seeking privacy and luxury in the $200 billion North American hotel industry. Additionally, we are creating bespoke experiences like RH Yonville, an integration of food, wine, art, and design in the Napa Valley, RH1 and RH2 are private jets, and RH3 are luxury yacht that is available for charter in the Caribbean and Mediterranean where the wealthy and affluent visit and vacation. These immersive experiences expose new and existing uh, customers to, to our evolving authority in architecture, interior design, and landscape architecture. This leads to our long-term strategy of building the world's first consumer-facing architecture, interior design, and landscape architecture services platform inside our galleries, elevating the RH brand and amplifying our core business by adding new revenue streams while disrupting and redefining multiple industries. Our strategy comes full circle as we begin to conceptualize and sell spaces, moving beyond the 170 billion home furnishings market into the 1.7 trillion North American housing market with the launch of RH Residences. Fully furnished luxury homes, condominiums, and apartments with integrated services deliver taste and time value to discerning time-starved consumers. Our ecosystem of products, places, services, and spaces inspires customers to dream, design, dine, travel, and live in a world thoughtfully curated by RH, creating an emotional connection unlike any other brand in the world. The entirety of our strategy is designed to come to life digitally as we launch the world of our age, an online portal where customers can explore and be inspired by the depth and dimension of our brand. Our authority as an arbiter of taste will be further amplified when we introduce our age media, a content platform that will celebrate the most innovative and influential leaders who are shaping the world of architecture and design. Our plan to expand the RH ecosystem globally multiplies the market opportunity to seven to 10 trillion, one of the largest and most valuable addressed by any brand in the world today. A 1% share of the global market represents a 70 to $100 billion opportunity. Taste can be elusive, and we believe no one is better positioned than RH to create an ecosystem that makes taste inclusive, and by doing so, elevating and rendering our way of life more valuable. The right people are our greatest, greatest asset. At our age, we believe deeply <clears throat> that the right people are our greatest asset. We value people with high energy who have the ability to energize others, people who are smart, creative, and have a point of view, people who see the answer in every problem versus those who see the problem in every answer, people who are driven, determined, and won't take no for an answer. We value team players, people who are more concerned with what's right rather than who's right. Damani Price, our Chief Operating Service and Values Officer, often says, the right people are our greatest asset and the wrong people are our greatest liability. He also reminds us that the right people are a reflection of all 11 tenets of our people value above. I wanna thank the, the right people who bring our vision and values to life each and every day. The 11 out of the 11s, as DP would call them. Thank you for your energy, your point of view, for not taking no for an answer and for being more concerned with what's right rather than who's right as we continue our quest to become one of the most admired brands in the world. Carpe diem. At this point, I'll open the call to questions, operator. Thank you, and as a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star and then the number one on your telephone keypad. And to withdraw your question, just press the pound key. Given time constraints, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. We'll pause for a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Stephen Forbes from Guggenheim. Your line is open. Good afternoon, Gary. Jack Allison. Uh, yeah, Gary, given the combination of supply chain challenges, right, rising cost pressures, which I believe is 
driving rising retail, uh, rising retails. Curious if you could just discuss at a high level whether you're seeing any changes in customer engagement or customer conversion trends, as well as cancellation rates. And, and the idea is just trying to gain a level of comfort here on, on what's driving your conviction to raise guidance yet again this year as we look towards the back half without having right this new product launch uh, potentially stimulating more demand. Yeah, well, Steve, I start with the fact that you know we have insights into the quarter. You know, we're we're relatively well into the third quarter today, and we have accelerating demand in the quarter. Uh, uh, you know, kind of month over month already. So, um, and, you know, we, we can see, you know, just, you know, stand back and think about new newness is going to add to a very large business we have here. It's not going to replace the very large business that we have. So the underlying business is very healthy. You know, we went through a, a period of our highest out of stocks and highest back orders that we ever experienced. Uh, our inventory levels are starting to get better, um, and even though uh, even though we're delaying the launch of Contemporary, and we're delaying once again all the newness that would go into RH Interiors, RH Modern, RH Rugs, RH you know everything else, Beach House, Ski House, everything else we would normally mail. Um, you know the 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 guidance is um, our best view. Uh, of what we see, and I, I think if you just, I don't know, look at the last four or five years of history, you know, since we kind of reconceptualized the supply chain and moved to membership in 2016, mm-hmm. I don't think we've missed a quarter in five years, you know, so um, I don't know how much more convin- conviction or pattern recognition you'd need. No, that's helpful. And then, and then just a quick follow-up. As I think back to the first quarter letter, there was commentary about the broader international pipeline. I think it was five leases were signed, five in final negotiations. Any update on how that pipeline has come together? Um, any update you can provide would be helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing really new, or we would have we would have talked about it in the in the letter. Um, you know, it's it's a little difficult to kind of travel and you know. Uh, negotiate an international business right now, so um, you know, and coordinate the kind of meetings and conversations. But uh, um, nothing's changed. I think we still, you know, we we have kind of five deals uh, that we're you know we're moving forward with. We have uh, multiple deals, you know, five or you know, looking at more. We you know, the the pipeline as far as opportunities that we're looking at is going to continue to grow. Uh, as you know, our you know galleries are very very unique, um, and you know not not so where you can just you know walk to a street and find a building that that we need. So, but you know we're we're confident that we're going to be able to you know scale the brand. We're one of the only people uh, in Europe with any kind of a specialty business that can sell off multiple levels and multiple floors. You know that can use gardens and rooftops and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, but uh, you know our, our our focus uh, to uh, launch the brand is, you know, is, is it's the number one priority in the company right now. You know, that and the expansion of our product and our, you know, our hands are a bit tied on the product and, you know, less tied on the international expansion. Uh, but, uh, you know, unless something else drastically changes uh, in the world uh, or with, you know, with new strains of the, as a virus, uh, we we feel very confident that we're going to, uh, you know, deliver everything that we've we've just put out in this letter. So, this is our best thinking today, and we're really confident about this. If something new changes, uh, you know, I don't think when, you know, when we talked last, you know, there was much of a Delta variant or uh, you know any anything that was happening. Yeah. You know, so the, you know, I I went on vacation in July. You know, and you know, thought like, you know, masks are off, and wow, wasn't that interesting? Threw all my masks away and came back to work and needed to buy a new mask. So, you know, that you know, <laughs> the world is is changing quickly here, and I think we've all got to learn to 
improvise, adapt, and overcome, uh, you know, at a, you know, whole new level. But, um, you know, you build new muscles. And, uh, you know, I, I'm extremely proud of the team, you know, for, for our executing execution thus far. If you would have, you know, asked me a year ago when we were running 47 comp in August, uh, I think that was our peak month, guys, right, in the core business. Yeah, you know, were we going to come around and, you know, comfortably comp 47? Um, I wouldn't have said, you know, that I would be confident about that. Based on the fact that, uh, you know, August is in the rearview mirror and, you know, the first couple of weeks of September, you know, look really good uh, and you know our in stocks are you know starting to get better a bit uh, and you know we we have flow of goods coming you know but we focus the flow on our core business you know on our best sellers and the things that that drive our business and you know as we should by the way the, the customer is not going to walk in and go oh Where's that? I thought you were going to have that. They've never seen that. You know, they've never seen anything. In this. There's no expectation. Right? And our, our business is one, if you think about it, it's not really an impulse business. I mean, you're, you're furnishing a home. It's not, it's not a big impulse business. You're, you know, you're planning it. You're shopping. You know, you're working with designers. You know, our, you know, our, you know, our time with a consumer, you know, is weeks and months to, uh, you know, to do an order. So, um, you know, even if the newness comes in, you know, there's there's a multiple month kind of ramp period, uh, you know, but I, I would just say, you know, I'd stand back and say, what would, you know, like, look, if we were selling cheap goods, a lot easier to kind of bring in cheap goods, you know, in the market right now, right? We're, we're selling the highest quality goods at scale in the world, in the home home business, you know, so, and we're we're trying to elevate the quality of the goods. So the next round of goods is a whole nother level of quality and design. You don't rush quality. You wait for it. And guess what? People pay for it. Um, and, you know, so, you know, like if, if someone thinks they want to measure us in a, in a, you know, pandemic, you know, where, you know, there's a lot of people that are sick and dying in Vietnam right now. And, you know, and I, you know, I feel terrible for what's going on there. You know, you people that, you know, their their lives depended on it, on it, you know, to you know, to feed their families, and they can't work. You know, um, you know, so you know, we're going to be okay here. You know, our our business is ripping. <laughs> we we have like I said, I mean, I you know, maybe somebody else has forty percent, you know, two year growth. Uh, not many. I don't think anybody's going to have the two-year growth that we're going to report in the third and fourth quarters because our business is accelerating. So, um, uh, you know, but I, I just focus on the big picture and what's really important. And what's really important is our demand is building. We've had some of the you know, best business in the industry. We're taking market share. We're expanding operating margins. And there's, you know, people sick and dying out in the world today, you know, and you've got to, you know, you've got to make the right decisions, help, you know, help them prioritize, prioritize their lives, you know, do what's right for the long term, uh, you know, you know, not, you know, it's like I, I told the team from the very beginning of this pandemic, we're not going to chase every sale here, you know, we we're, we're we're lucky, we've we've had a tailwind, most of the world has had a headwind. People are sick and dying for almost two years now in this world. You know, our business is doing great. We feel blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Lasser from UBS. Your line is open. Good evening. Thanks a lot for taking my question, Gary. Are you planning for your path over the next few years from a sales and a margin perspective to be linear. You have all these initiatives in place. Some of them are being delayed from this year to next year. That's going to mean some cost shifts from this year to next year. 
So should we be modeling your business that sales and margin over the next few years continue to build year after year? Um, you know, Michael, uh, we're not giving kind of you know, detailed guidance over the next couple of years. I, I would say, uh, you know, it's, it's like someone who, you know, asked me, well, gosh, you're saving money, so your earnings are up because you're not mailing your catalog. Well, we don't mail our catalog and get zero, and we don't mail our catalog to lose money. So we're not mailing our catalogs, so we're not getting revenues. Um, you know, so we, we invest in things that drive revenues and drive profit. Uh, you know, where we've got new business investments, where we've got to make, you know, some infrastructure investments as we launch Europe and things like that, of course, you're going to have some initial period to ramp. What does that look like when we open in a new country? Let me see. Let me look at past data. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have any. <laughs> I don't mean to make a joke about that, but no, no, um, so I, I just like, you know, there's some things if you, you can waste a lot of time thinking about. I think what we've got to do is open great consumer experiences in Europe. We've got to, you know, launch with a great website. We've got to launch with real intelligent marketing. Uh, we've got to be prepared to execute uh, whether the first year's 50 million or 250 million. You tell me, like, hey, let's stand back and think about this for a second. There's 39 million people in California. If I had new, exciting design galleries in California, California would be, I don't know, an $800 million business for us, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more. There's 68 million people in the UK. There's relatively similar de demographics, slightly wealthier in California, but more people. You know, so, you know, I would say, California, when we continue to expand the brand, looks like a billion-dollar business. Let's call the U.K. a billion-dollar business. Let's call the U.K. today $800 million. What happens when you have a brand that's really well-known in a very small market like ours, right? Like, we're, we're at the top kind of – the very top of the pyramid. There's not a lot of people there. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of homes, and they spend exponentially on the home. They directionally, I mean, you know, the, some of the data we've seen and, you know, some of the research we've seen from some of our large investors who have, you know, done pretty deep research, done their own research and, you know, have researched interior designers in the UK and in France. And, you know, what percent of interior designers know us? Like 80, 90 percent. So almost 100 percent in some cases. So they, they know us. Um, they're a key customer. Uh, you know, for, for our business, uh, you know, high end consumers, I think, pretty much know us, uh, you know, and admire us. So, you know, what happens when you open, you know, an incredible 73 acre estate, you know, probably will be one of the most exciting, innovative retail experiences in the world. Uh, granted, it's, it's, a bit outside London, uh, but, you know, our business is a destination. And what happens when you, you know, you, you launch with a website with, you know, you know 40,000 SKUs, you know, and, you know, the, the most dominant assortment in the country and, um, and, and you have relatively high awareness. I, I don't know. I got to believe it's going to be better than other people that, you know, target a big, wide audience and don't have high recognition because they've got to spend a lot of time getting known. So, you know, I, I, don't, I really don't know if first-year sales in the U.K. will be 50 or $250 million. That's our range. I know Understood. directionally what we have to spend, you know, but, you know, I, I'm just trying to be honest with everybody here. You know, no matter if it's 50 or 250 it's going to be really big over the next couple of years. So, you know, I, you know, we're going to learn a lot when we get going. And I, and I think, you know, I say that, you know, yeah, I don't mean to kind of go into a long ramble on question. I just say that so I don't get the same question four times in a different way. Yeah, I'm just trying I to be trans uh, Yeah. That's helpful. Um, my my yeah. follow-up question is, 
it's, you, you're articulating a lot of enthusiasm and, and confidence for the back half of the year in part because of the, the quarter to date trends, uh, the demand comp, the two year accelerating based on what you experienced in the second quarter. Can you give us what the second quarter demand comp was so we can have a, a calibration uh, for our models on, on how, the, uh, how that metric unfolded? Yeah, it's just too crazy right now. Look, I, I don't want to make it a habit. We, we gave demand comps, you know, during the, you know, most kind of, you know, crazy time of the pandemic in the first year. And, you know, I don't want to give demand comps for the rest of our lives, right? It's, it's uh, you know, I think, again, I, I would, you know, just like I answer Steve's question, I, I think we have a pretty good track record of um, doing what we say we're going to do. You know, I don't think we have a track record of guiding aggressively. Um, so the numbers may look aggressive to you. Uh, you know, I'm sure Q1 looked really aggressive to everyone, right? We took the numbers up pretty big when we reported Q1, you know, earnings and our stock went up $100 in one day. Uh, and, yeah, I got a lot of questions like, yeah, you really took the, the numbers up. Do you think you're going to make them? You know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say. So it's, you know, we, it, it's not like someone hands me a sheet and says, here's the recommended guidance, Gary. You know, I, I sit here with 20 people for hours and hours and hours going through categories and trends and, you know, every detail in our business, you know, we turn over every rock, we, uh, you know, gain alignment and clarity, you know, we gain clarity and then we, you know, gain alignment on where we believe the numbers are going to be. And we've been doing it long enough that we've gotten pretty good with it, even in a time like this, you know, so, you know, I think we were one of the first ones to start giving an outlook. Now, a lot of people didn't even give any kind of directional guidance for this. You know, we did. You know, you know so, I, I, and we did because we're confident that we know our business. You know, if, if something massively changes in the world, um, God, it all bets are off. But based on what we know today, you know, based on the data, you know, you're looking at and we're looking at, um, you know, this is our guidance. It's Understood. generally not too aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. Good luck. Sure. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Max Racklin Cole from Cohen and Company. Your line is open. Great. Thanks a lot. So a couple bigger picture questions here. So the first one is, Gary, what do you think uh, is your share of the luxury segment of the market today, you had a comment in one of your recent letters that your competitors are closing or downsizing their stores, and with RH continuing to transition to galleries, longer term, where do you think your market share could go over time? Um, yeah, I say we we have a clear line of sight to five to six billion in North America, and you know that may be bigger depending on you know the product innovation. Uh, and elevation and all the, you know, concepts that I've articulated, uh, which, you know, are really not all of them are even in, in that number, right? So I'd say, you know, to not hit the five to six billion, you know, something would have to go really wrong here. You know, if we, if we just continue to transform you know, existing galleries to design galleries and you know, launch contemporary and it does directionally what we think it's going to do, continue to expand and upgrade, uh, you know, our, our, our product assortments and interiors and modern, you know, expand our rug business, you know, build and dimensionalize our textiles business, you know, continue to build and expand our lighting business, um, uh, you know, and, and add new, the new categories. And if we're directionally right, you know, does that number get bigger than 6 million? More likely than not. 
you know, but today we're very confident about five to six billion in North America. So, um, uh, you know, so I think to do that, we have to take market share, right? Like take Marin County here. You know, we had a gallery that's doing about 18 million. Um, you know, and we have a new gallery that we opened. I mean, I might even be able to throw a football and hit our old, old gallery from our new gallery, standing on the roof, maybe. You know, <laughs> but, you know, it's not very far. It's like a 20-yard 20, 20 pass. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many people have done this before, but we're, you know, we opened a new gallery and it's trending, what, guys, at about $50 million, somewhere in that range. Um, and um, I think it's a combination of us creating a new market because people are seeing product in, you know, that they've never seen before, presented in a way they've never seen before, you know, in an environment that's inspiring and interactive and, you know, full of light and fresh air and, uh, you know, the, theatrical presentation. We, we you know, we, we, we call them galleries because we say it's an artful abstraction of home furnishings in a gallery setting, right? So, you know, we don't really just merchandise our stores. We, you know, we create kind of artistic installations of home furnishings. So that, you know, people haven't seen anything like this before. Uh, so, you know, I think it, from some, some degree, it, it creates a new market, but you know, one, what, you know, some of the math I, I give people examples, say it's like, if you take our Marin, our H Marin, you know, cause we're talking about that one right now. Yeah. You know, five years ago, four or five years ago, there were 32 what I'd call higher end home stores from Sausalito to Santa Rosa, including, you know, the Napa Valley. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to name them because, you know, who knows, you know, people are sitting on the phone listening to our call, but, um, you know, but, but there's, you know, small boutiques, mom and pops, some regional players, and their, their stores are about 3,500, to 15,000 square feet. Our gallery was about 6,500 square feet. So it's kind of in the middle. In our gallery here in Marin, we, I think we had five you know, sofa collections, six sofa collections, probably five dining collections, and you know, five or six bedroom collections in, in the gallery. So the other galleries, if we were right in about the middle, we had, you know, we looked like everybody else. Kind of, we weren't really differentiated. And by the way, in that gallery, when we closed it, it had less than 2% of our assortment, right? Like 2%, call it, maybe 1.5% of our, of our assortment. So you couldn't really see our assortment in that gallery. That's why we mailed really big books, right? Because if you saw our big book, you know, hit your doorstep, and other people's thin books, you'd, you'd go, hey, those guys have a lot more than everybody else. Because if you just went in the physical world, we don't look like we have any more than anybody else where we have, you know, our, our you know, traditional galleries. Now, you know, our galleries in and of themselves, our, our, our uh, legacy galleries, you know, probably outperform competitors three to four to one in the same square footage. Uh, but, but when we open a big gallery, I always tell people that, the 32 is going to, 32 kind of what you call maybe could be competitors, higher end, you know, home boutiques, you know, and uh, generally more expensive than us, you know, long wait times, you know, don't have the infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, and, but I'd say half of them go away pretty quickly. You know, and, and, you know, we'll do another survey and, you know, do the count of, you know, did it go, you know, after year one, did it go from 32 to, 25, did it go to 32 to 18, did it go to 32 to 10? Um, but yeah, we're, we're not, it's just not completely a new market we're creating. Uh, but it's like, I, you know, I compare it and don't, don't take this wrong. You know, they'll probably write this on some letter. Gary Friedman now compares it to Apple. You know, I can't remember who last time I said something and we, you know, I was claiming that I compared us to some, you know, to Hermes. That's right. You know, it's talking about the financial model. It, uh, um, but, uh, you know, Apple was kind of the last people into the cell phone game, 
but they created a new game. They created a new market. It was more than a phone. So it, it created a new market and it also took massive market share. I think directionally, you know, we're you know, kind of similar to that. We're creating a new market and we're taking market share pretty aggressively, you know, on both sides of the scale. And I think when, I, when we look at Europe, just to kind of talk about that for a second, that the competitive landscape in Europe is significantly weaker than it is in the, in the U.S. So I think we'll be even more disruptive and, and, you know, and differentiated uh, in Europe. And that's why we're very confident about it. Great. That's uh, very helpful. And can you discuss your cash deployment priorities? You're now sitting with almost $300 million of cash on the balance sheet. And with free cash flow set to accelerate over the coming years, you'll have uh, a lot of opportunities. So how are you thinking about reinvesting back in the business versus M&A or ramping up uh, share repurchases? Thank you. Thinking about all of the above, Jack. I don't know what I was going to say the same thing, and even more things. Yeah, but I'm just every quarter, and, and I think we answered. Yeah, way, so we we have a cash chessboard sitting here. <laughs> you know, so we we there's all kinds of moves, and um, you know, we're just waiting for the right time to make the right moves. But we're looking at a lot of things, uh, whether it's uh, you know investments into the business and innovation in the business, whether it's investments into M&A and acquisition that will strengthen our, you know, positioning or, or you know, elevate our, our business and brand. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about share repurchases and uh, everything you think that we're probably thinking about, we're, we're thinking about. Um, so, but we, we tend to, you know, be opportunistic and, uh, you know, so, and, and patient. So we'll, at the right time, I think we'll, make a good move on our chessboard. Right now, all the pieces are still there. We haven't moved anything yet, but we've contemplated a lot. Understood, best regards. Thank you, thanks, Max. Thank you, your next question comes from the line of Adrian Yi from Barclays, your line is open. Excuse me, Adrian. Can you please unmute your line? Your line is open now. Hello, I'm Hi, Adrian. You might be on mute. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, Adrian. Oh, hey, sorry about that. I, I, just, I don't know what happened, but congrats on the consistency, the success, and the progress. Um, just awesome to see this. Um, Gary, I wanted to continue to focus on the European opportunity the 15 to 20 billion outside of North America. Um, can you talk about specifically the TAM in Europe? And I guess really what I want to know is it really feels like, you know, our contemporary is going to come online. Sounds like there's more investment, more design, elevating the product overall. And as you shift into the international market, do you feel that the target household income or the demographic is materially different? than sort of where our age has been maybe, say, over the past five to ten years. Um, just seems like there's a greater appetite and appreciation for luxury uh, brands and goods when we kind of cross the, cross the pond. Thanks so much. I don't know what I could add to that. Um, that that's how we see it. Uh, <laughs> no, but wait, we have, let's, I mean, let's start with the global opportunity. Again, it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's directional math, uh, you know, based on looking at the pie in many ways, you know, uh, wealth, consumers, housing markets, um, uh, you know, the uh, high net worth, ultra high net worth uh, uh, ratios. It's based on looking at luxury brands and penetration and volume uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, you know, so, so we, you know, we've looked at the math multiple ways, and I think we're directionally right. If you were here, you'd see a big giant room where about 40 people get together generally on Thursdays. You know, big cross-functional team, and we've got 
all of Europe. First, we had the whole world, and it was just too much to look at. So we said, like, yeah, right now, just get the rest of the world in the next room. We've got it at the top line. But, you know, let's really break down Europe and understand it, you know, understand each country, go deeper, you know, look at other people's, you know, uh, approaches and real estate strategies, you know, whether it's, you know, not everybody that, you know, has an Apple phone shops at our age, but, um, but most people at the high end of the market, you know, spend a lot of money at Apple, I'd say. So, you know, we look at where are the Apple stores, where are the iconic Apple stores, where, you know, where are the big suburb Apple stores, where, you know, other businesses that we're familiar with, where are the, you know, the luxury good players in the suburbs, you know, the, the hardest thing in, in, I think in Europe is going to be, you know, we don't know their suburbs like we know our suburbs. You know, we don't know their market like we know their market. Now we've, we've expanded our team. I think we've got a great leader. He knows Europe very well, but, but, uh, but there's no one like us, right? There's not a, there's not a real comp, um, but there's enough similarities that gives us, you know, confidence as we dimensionalize what we believe the market opportunity is, at least today. Um, so I, you know, and again, I, as, as I look at it, I, I think, and I, and I believe, you know, most of our senior team and not, I don't, I don't think really influenced by me because we, you know, we tend to just debate everything here. Uh, and, um, you know, when, when I usually say, so, you know, if Ari Chaya, if I say something and she goes, Gary, you know, like, it's like, it usually, sorry, Ari, she's sitting right here, you know, but, but, you know, she says that all the time, by the way, you know, I would say, you know, she keeps me out of the ditch, but, um, so, so, uh, but yeah, but we, you know, we spent a lot of time together cross functionally debating this. We've had people who, um, you know, who have a lot of insights on European expansion and so on and so forth that so we, we feel good about that. Uh, you know, as we, you know, I think we're going to be some, you know, directionally right. And that's, that's all you need to be at this stage. You know, you don't really want to boil the ocean. It doesn't, you know, you know like it's, I always say like, it's like the settlers that came to America. You know, some people said, Hey, go West young man, there's gold in them, their hills. And some people just went West and, you know, and they <laughs> kind of hit the Sierra Nevada and there was gold. Other people, like, were sitting in Boston trying to figure exactly where on the West Coast they wanted to be. And by the time they, you know, got in their horse and, you know, cart, the other people were, you know, they were, like, getting to the Sierra Nevada. So we, we you know, we, so we don't exactly, <laughs> does it really matter if we're $10 billion off, would we not do what we're doing today? doesn't really matter, right? Like, if yeah. the opportunity is only $15 billion, you know, or $10 billion in Europe, does it matter? Would you not go? That's, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I say to the team. So just being transparent. You just, you go, you know, like, and you go to Europe first. You know, it's the most, you know, it's the most yeah. familiar, it's the most connected. So, so anyway, um, and, uh, and then I say, you know, the, the, the idea that, you know, the, the target demographic material difference and, you know, where RH has been over the past five to 10 years, yes. Um, uh, you know, it's, you know, here it is and, you know, and it's going to be there and it's going to continue to evolve. We're going to continue to go up. I think we'll continue to shed, you know, consumers at the bottom and we'll, and we'll grow consumers at the top of the funnel where there's exponential spending. And yep. by doing that, I think all of a sudden, long term will pull people up because the brand will be more aspirational. People will save to buy, you know, our sofa. Um, you know, there's, you know, a, a demographic that will be younger and less affluent, but they'll have great taste and style and they'd rather have a few good pieces than a whole bunch of crap, you know, and that's the way I grew up. I remember when I bought my first twin 10 speed, you know, it's like, it's sixty five dollars technique. I mowed a lot of young, mowed a lot of uh, yeah, yeah, lawns to get that Schwinn ten speed. I didn't buy, you know, a crappy Montgomery Ward's bike, you know. And so, you know, I mean, it's so it's just it, it's that kind of stuff, you know. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to, you know, overly simplify it, but there's going to be consumers that, you know, they want 
a part of you know a, a, a part of the very best in life and they aspire to it like nobody thought the apple phone was going to be the number one phone in the world nobody thought the apple phone was going to sell in china it became the best selling phone in china you know like people want better quality all the time i mean gavin grover our, our lawyer says this to me all the time like says you know history has proven that people want better and better quality you know and mm -hmm. and you know the world is generally you know heads in that direction so uh yeah you know, we think again we're going west there's gold in them there hills you know we're going in the right direction yeah we're gonna you know we're gonna be fine Gary, I love it. It's great. Fantastic. Always food for thought, right. so appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Chuck Grom from Gordon Haskett. Your line is open. Hey, um, good afternoon. Nice quarter. Um, Gary, just curious on the, the long-term opportunity as you see it for, for RH Guest House. And then in your prepared remarks, you, you spoke to the migration of consumers to larger homes and and the, and the demand that's driving is, I was just wondering if there's a way to contextualize the size of that demand. Thanks. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody's got the real data on it. With the, the, the key is there's, you know, there's been an exodus from cities. You know, COVID was this, was the, uh, you know, it's been a stimulus for that. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the one that made this up. Actually, one of our big shareholders, you know, identified this early on and and they said you know they did math you know their math on, on this and it was going to exponentially you know they thought play in our favor uh and you know then we did some you know kind of smaller research uh you know they did but it's you know it's that's what's happened right you've, you've had people migrating to suburbs uh migrating to second home markets you know, places like Napa, Aspen, the Hamptons, um, you know, Palm Desert, kind of second home markets like that that are drivable for people uh, that, you know, they're at some distance where they can work part time in the cities but live out of the cities. Uh, those markets have exploded. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't buy homes in the nice suburbs. I mean, it's just multiple offers and, um, you know, rising prices. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, and, and so the, the simple, the simple math is this, you know, like take a, someone lives in a, you know, 2,500 or foot, you know, apartment in New York or, you know, very, very nice 3,000 square foot apartment and they moved to a house in Greenwich, you know, what's the comparable house in Greenwich? Six to 10,000 square feet, could be two to three times the square footage those rooms aren't going to be empty, not if they can afford to furnish them. So that's kind of a good thing for us. And that's why I think that uh, even without any newness for almost two years, you know, our, our two-year comp is, you know, is growing, you know, so, uh, and I, and, and the, what's, what's the main thing that changed is, we're in a much better stock position, like back orders are down 10 points or more. You know, it's like, um, what's the, the latest word? I mean, they just don't tell everybody, just hold your fingers up to me. But you know, direct, like the last time I looked at a couple weeks ago, it was about down, it's about 10 points, even more than 10, that more than 10. So as back orders are going down, demand's going up, right? And that, that makes sense. Like, you know, I mean, our back orders at their peak, you know, we're four times normal. Yeah, four times normal. And, uh, you know, so now, you know, they're down to probably uh, two and a half times normal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and they, sh you know, should get better because I think we've done a good job prioritizing uh, production and flow. And I, man, I'm, I'm glad we didn't try to do, you know, newness because, you know, newness usually takes longer. You know, they, I, I think it's going to be great. I think we'll have the best newness introductions we've ever had in our history. We've had more time to refine samples, to get things right, to quality assure things. Are you know, we're not rushing our manufacturing partners. You know, um, and so we we will have by the time newness launches, we'll have 
two years of newness, four seasons of newness. I, I don't, I, we've never launched that much newness at one time. I like, yeah, you know, people are going to think it's like Christmas again at our age. We don't even sell Christmas stuff, but you know, it's going to be like, what the heck just happened? You know, I think that, that the, the aesthetic evolution and the quality evolution of the brand will be shocking to the consumers. It looks so good. I mean, I seriously, I wish everybody on the phone, including all our people, because I know we usually have, you know, like a lot of, you know, our teams, all our galleries probably have an open line. Our DCs have an open line. And there's, you know, it, there's probably a couple thousand people in our company listening to this call, maybe more. Um, and like, I wish I seriously right now, I wish, you know, we were out of COVID. We can get everybody together and take everybody through what's coming. Contemporary is shocking. It's so good. It, like, I, you know, I thought modern was great. Contemporary is the best work we've ever done. You know, I, it's just going to, it's just going to open up the aperture of the brand. I think people at the highest end, the highest end interior designers are going to go, what did they just do? Like, it looks so good. You know, I mean, it's maybe, you know, 20 interior designers in the world that were not going to completely impress, you know, you know, like the really silly rich people, you know, they use them like everybody else. Yeah. They're, you know, they're just going to go, uh Oh, you know, we better join that, <laughs> that movement there or we'll get left behind. It's, it's really, really great stuff in the pipeline. And we've had a lot of time to refine it and make it better. You know, we'll probably have, you know, we'll launch with the lowest returns, the lowest, you know, damages, you know, all the kind of things that happen when you ramp up, you know, new goods, you know, new factories, if you have new materials, new materials, new construction, um, you know, especially with a big, big aesthetic move and opening of an aperture, like we're going to a contemporary, but even the product in interiors and modern, the new stuff and, and the quality impact that, uh, you know, our teams that are working on couture and bespoke, you know, we, we have like some of the greatest experts from this, the highest end of the industry. So I wish I could talk about them. Yeah, because I'm not allowed to announce anything. Uh, but like, yeah, a couple of them are sitting in the room right now. They look like they're going to like, they have their masks on, but you can tell they're smiling and turning red. Um, but like the best that we have some of the best people in the, in the industry. When the industry here is who's on our team, everybody's going to go, uh oh, you know, so. Um, you know, it's just great stuff coming. I couldn't be, couldn't be more excited. You know, I, I just wish everybody could be here and see it. And, uh, yeah, but that's okay. We'll just make it. The good news is like, we keep making it better. So every, you know, every season we, we delay it, you know, like it gets so much better. So, um, so it's you know, between now and next spring, it's going to continue to get better. The presentation that, you know, the execution and, you know, so we're, you know, super, super excited, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and I think that the market, you know, that I think there's, look, I was the guy, you know, I, I, I'm the guy who thought there'd be a recession the last five years. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was ready for a recession the last five years. I've been really wrong. Instead, what happened a pandemic. Um, so, um, you know, but now I'm, I'm finally thinking, okay, you know, I, I called this wrong. I never thought we'd be comping 47 comp with no new goods, uh, you know, and, you know, back orders, you know, at, at three times historical rates, two and a half times historical rates, you know, and, you know, but we are. And so I think that, that again, that the home business, you know, the home, people buy a home, they don't furnish it all immediately. You know, it, it's over a period of time, you know, it takes a long time. I mean, right now you can't get a contractor to remodel a bathroom. You know, you, you can't get interior designers are all backed up. You know, our teams have been backed up, you know, like, you know, you know, customers complaining, like, how come I have to wait so long for an interior designer? You know, I mean, they're all busy, you know, professional services around the home are all busy. Um, you know, there's not enough homes. There's not enough people to build homes. There's not enough people to, you know, design, you know, do interior design. You know, there's backups everywhere now. Uh, yeah, so so even if and and we're at record levels everywhere. So even if the market slows down, you know, people go, oh, the home business is a little off, or 
you know, Pulte took numbers down a little bit. The question is, did Pulte take numbers down a little bit? How are those numbers compared to historical numbers? They're still really good numbers. You know, and so if, if you're in our position and you're kind of, you know, a, a brand without a lot of peers and, you know, building a market of one and you're the place to go, and especially where we have these new galleries that are having outsized growth, right? Um, you know, there's, you know, it's like we're in a really good place today. So, I, you know, I just think that, uh, um, you know, I, I've gotten more optimistic, you know, and, and, you know, look, it's my fault that we have the highest back orders too. You know, I cut the inventories too aggressively. And then, you know, when the trends, you know, went to 20, I said, buy 10. You know, when the trends went to 40, I said, they'll never stay there, buy 20. You know, they'll, they're only going to be there for two weeks and then they didn't stop, you know, so, you know, so like, you know, the fish stinks at the head, right? Like I kind of screwed a lot of this stuff up too, because, you know, I didn't make some of those calls were just kind of risky. You know, you don't want to all of a sudden fight a, a 40% increase and, you know, then you're kind of pregnant with all the inventory and the sales drop from 40 to eight, you know, to up eight. And you're like, uh oh, you know, so. You know, we've been chasing it the whole time. Probably a lot. Of, I'm probably not the only person that you know was too conservative buying inventory. Uh, so I think that pent up demand and some of the commentary in the home business about pent up demand, I think it's all kind of right. You know, and and even you know, I think about why I got the economy wrong um, over the last five years. I think there's a new economy when when you think about the dynamics of the you know the current global economy, the stock markets, and what's driving everything. There's there's new businesses, there's new kind of companies, there's new industries that are being formed. There's faster and faster, you know, innovation and, you know, technology is changing the world in an exponential way. So, you know, look at the last recession, which was now, like, I can't believe, like, 08, 09, it was like, you know, 14, you know going on 14 years, so wait, right? Like, we're, you know, going to be in 22 pretty soon. You know, the long, I think the longest economic expansion in the history of the United States before that was 11 years, right? So we've never seen this, right? And, uh, and even through a pandemic, which was like a, you know, kind of, I guess, a, a recession, but, but not normal, right? Like, it, you know, so, um, you know, so I think there's this underlying structure of a new economy that is, you know, that is making businesses more productive, um, you know, I, I think about how much more productive we are because of technology and the things we're doing inside the company, uh, you know, in, in all, at all levels, you know, you know and, uh, uh, you know, how other companies must be more productive and all the new innovative kind of companies that are changing the world. And, you know, I mean, in 08, 09, I think there was two companies that were 500 billion, like GE and Exxon, right, or something like that. Like maybe Apple, I think, you know, was getting close. You know, now there's, you know, multiple trillion dollar, you know, companies and, uh, you know, many more $500 billion companies and, you know, and they're growing, you know, uh, you know, so, so I think that there's a lot of things that are different that, um, probably are harder to see because of the pandemic, you know, but, you know, when I, when I try to listen to, you know, the, the people that, are way smarter than I am about this. There's a lot more optimism in the smartest people I know who have generally been more critical and pessimistic, you know, so, you know, and, and yeah, they try to listen to them and, and connect the dots as it relates to our, our business. So, um, but I think, you know, I think things are very different. I think, you know, the pattern of recognition of before, you know, there's, probably just going to be all new patterns that we have to be prepared for. Uh, thanks, Gary. That, that's helpful. You, you, my thought was just, you, you talked about Pulte, um, and, and I'm just a little bit curious on RH residents, um, how that's going to be implemented. Um, I guess what's the timeline on that? Um, just any more color on that would be interesting to hear. Thanks. Yeah, just really long term. You know, we, we're, we're going to test some things in Aspen. You know, that's where we'll have a controlled launch of an ecosystem. And, uh, um, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of this is going to benefit the brand is just as far as awareness and kind of place, place making and, you know, becoming a, 
you know, taste maker and a, a you know, place maker and a space maker and, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, and we learn from these things. So I think that's the other thing that people underestimate when you do new things. It's not just about the new thing. It's about building new muscles and getting smarter and solving new kinds of problems. And, and you know, as, as human beings, growing exponentially, right? And, and having, you know, individuals and an organization in an upward spiral of learning and growing, you know, that's what's invigorating uh, for humans. And, and that's what makes, you know, great companies invigorating. You know, so when you stop inventing and you stop, you know, learning and, and educating, and, and it's even like, I, you know, it's, it's so funny. I used to think, you know, when I grew up at the Gap, we had all these formalized training programs and all this stuff. And I, you know, like, you know, it's a training program for everything, you know, like <laughs> you couldn't, you know, these big manuals. I, and I used to think like, oh, gosh, you know, you got to have all stuff. And I, I realized like, you know, many of those years early in the Gap, you know, before Mickey Drexler got there, it's all about management, right? And and uh, and it wasn't very exciting growing up there back then until Mickey Drexler got there, and then things changed, you know. And and I think when you're, you know, when you're inventing and innovating, you know, it's it's just really stimulating for smart, driven people, you know, because they're learning by doing. You know, they're learning by being evolved. You know, they're not learning by studying an operational manual. You know, they're not in some theoretical training class talking about theoretically how you might do this and being taught by someone who's never done it, you know. And so we kind of like do shit here. Like we, we're, we get into it and we get really involved and we all get really deep and, uh, you know, and, and it's just super exciting. You know, someone would have said I'd be more excited than any point in time in my life at my age, it's impossible. I'd say, no way. Like, I'm so excited I can't sleep, which is not good for my health. But, you know, it's seriously, that's, I'm so excited I can't sleep. You know, there's no, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a beautiful thing, you know, for people that really want to create and um, invent and evolve and grow and, you know, and do new things. And that's why, you know, when, when I get questions about what exactly do you think Europe's going to be? I don't know. Like, you know, like how much volume did I think the big galleries were going to be? Did I think they were going to be as big as they were? It's been exactly, it, in November, it'll be exactly 10 years since we opened RH Houston. We opened that. People said it was the best retail home store in the world, maybe one of the most beautiful retail stores in the world. The 10-year lease is up. We're going to tear it down, and we're going to build a store four times bigger. Like, how many Houstons did we build? Kind of two. We built one there, and we built one in Scottsdale. And then the next thing we did was two times bigger and three times bigger. And then, you know, like, I remember – I, it, you know, I remember we had some people on the board at the time that really wanted us, like, Houston was so great. They said, just roll these out. Just do Houston. I don't think anybody that's sitting at this table that I'm looking at right here right now, you know, or any of the people in our leadership team meetings, I don't think anybody would be here if we were just rolling out Houston. I think we'd have a completely different, uninspiring management team. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but we don't even use the word manager in this company. Like we're allergic to that word. You know, management is about kind of arranging and organizing the status quo. Everybody here is titled a leader, right? Because, you know, leadership is about taking people somewhere they've never been, doing something they've never done. You know, and we say leaders have to be comfortable making others uncomfortable. You know, because, you know, you're in uncharted waters all the time. And when you get comfortable with that, it's exhilarating. Uh, and, you know, but, but I, I think we'd have a completely different team, you know, if we were just, like, shooting at the same target the same way, you know, you know just kind of organizing and arranging, uh, you know, the status quo. It's, you know, it's not what we do. 
we just say here, like, is it directionally right? Is it strategically right? Is it more right than wrong? Is it asymmetrical risk to the upside? You know, we do tons of math. We think really hard, really deeply about it. But then we get going because that's where you learn. That's where you grow. You know, and you get going and then, you know, just going to learn exponentially faster than everybody else. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, so, so residences and stuff like that, like, you know, if they're going to come in Aspen, might test and try other things. Jack and I met with an incredible guy. He's probably on this call. I'd say, I'd say your name, but I you know, can't do that. But, <laughs> but uh, incredible, like super inspiring. Yeah, grew up in the business, um, you know, sought us out and, you know, wants to help, you know, go put in a dent, put a dent in the universe with us and uh, create a whole different kind of a home business. And he, he knows like so much more than we know about building homes. And it's exactly like a lot of times in our organization, what gets these ideas going is the right people, right? Someone comes along and has, knows more than you do you know, has greater vision about the idea than you do, um, you know, is ready to go and excited to get going. And then you go, that's when it's time to go. We know it's directionally right. It all makes sense. But you need someone to kind of really lead us all there, you know. And uh, so if you're on the call, you know who I'm talking about. Um, you got my email the other day. <laughs> Ping me back. You know, we were traveling for a while, so we lost touch. But uh, and and if he joins the team, you'll probably hear about our each residences sooner than later. But that's awesome. how it comes together. Yeah. You know, so thank you, Gary. Yeah. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Curtis Nagel from Bank of America. Your line is open. Good evening. Thanks very much. Um, just, uh, I guess, Gary, a, a product question um, on Irish Antiques. Um, at least to me, that's that's a new one. Um, would you be able to give just, I don't know, maybe a sneak peek in terms of what you envision for this collection and how you might integrate it with the uh, entire offering? Sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, go into our one of our new galleries and go just walk through and count how many antiques and artifacts are in our galleries. A lot. People want to buy them, and we have to say no all the time. Every once in a while, they make us such a silly offer. We say yes, and then we replace them. But we even say no to some, some of the silly offers. We have some really cool stuff in our galleries, and it all renders you know, our product more valuable. And it's no different than people's homes, you know, where they want to be really unique, and they want some things in their homes that makes it theirs. So while our, our antiques and artifacts – will be limited to a degree because, you know, you, you can't go manufacture them. You know, what makes them unique and special is there's not that many. Um, and so, and I think we're good curators of it. I mean, we have warehouses of antiques and artifacts. We're probably, as a buyer of antiques and artifacts, we might be the biggest buyer in the world. Um, you know, if I told you what we spend on a new store in antiques and artifacts, Aries shaking her head. I'm not going to tell them. Um, you know, you'd be shocked at the number. But go walk a gallery and you could probably, you know, take a little pad out or you know, take your phone and get, do the calculator. And you're probably walking, you'll probably get close enough if you guess. But if you really look at it, like, you know, they really help, you know, help us look unique. And our, and our customers want their homes to be unique. You know, so we have some of our team, you know, in here, leader galleries that are all shaking their heads yes. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's how to think about it. You know, it's, 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 it's about all of these things in integration, not in isolation, right? We don't think about anything that we do in isolation. When we do, we're usually wrong looking at it incorrectly. So everything we do has to render everything else that we do more rather than less valuable, right? Usually when you try to do more, you actually do less. When you, you know, when you try to be additive, you're actually dilutive. Uh, cause you didn't think deeply enough about it and, and, you know, and think about, you know, how will this, you know, how will one plus one equal three, you know, or more. Um, so we believe things like RH antiques and artifacts will just like they render our galleries more valuable. They're going to render 
our uh, customers' homes more valuable, and our and our designers would tell you it's they're going to close a lot more sales. They're going to sell a lot more furniture. They're going to get a lot more unique homes that they may not get today, uh, you know, because right now we don't have that. And and we've discussed internally, like I don't know, do we open it up? Do we let them go, you know, shop first dibs, other things for antiques and artifacts, and just charge the customer, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, for for the for the service, and you know, make a margin on, you know, buying it just like an interior designer does. Uh, but but you know, first first dibs, by the way, which I think is great. So you know, I think they do, they've done a great job aggregating the world of antiques, but it's like you got to look through every, you know, to find the needle in the haystack. Like that's, it's really hard on first dibs. I mean, it used to be a lot easier. It's much more curated. Now it's like anybody who sells antiques can be on first dibs. So instead of finding the needle in the haystack, make the haystack out of needles, right? That will be our H antique and artifacts. Like you won't like have to dig through the haystack to find the needle. The haystack is made out of needles. Completely different way to think about it. Oh, very interesting. Appreciate it, Gary. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Tammy Zakaria from JP Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, Gary, Jack, and everyone. I uh, hope you're doing well, and thanks so much for taking my questions. I have a couple of quick ones, actually. Um, so first, I saw some of the uh, convertible notes uh, you have were moved to the current liability section of the balance sheet. So are these redeemable in the next 12 months? Well, so the convertible notes became convertible once we uh, exceeded the uh, you know, certain percentage of the convertible price. So it's, they've been convertible for a while, and they're coming in. Um, as you see on the balance sheet, we have uh, remaining converts uh, 652 million, but with uh, with re redemption requests that have come in um, that will be settled um, momentarily, we're we're actually uh, left with 411 million essentially as of today. Got it, got it. That's that's helpful. And then um, the second question: uh, Can you talk a little bit about the design services market in Europe? And what kind of opportunity you see there for RH, given this has been a great success for you in the U.S. market? So do you plan to have complementary design, uh, interior design service in Europe as well when you launch there? Yeah, I think our, our model is going to be, you know, almost identical, you know, but it'll be just kind of on the edges. It'll be modified for the market, you know, so... Um, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, some of the things we're doing, you know, again, you get to, you know, you get to think like a beginner, right? Like you're going to a new market, like you're not saddled with, you know, legacy stories. You're not saddled with old ways of doing things. You're not saddled with, well, this is the way we've always done it. Like, you know, we, we get to kind of be a beginner again, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, so you get to ask a whole lot of questions about what about this and what about that? And, you know, what if we did this way or that way? And it, and it tends to, uh, uh, you know, just stimulate a lot of innovation, new thinking and opportunity. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, you know, I think, I think for the most part, you know, it'll, the brand will be very recognizable. Um, but in, in many parts and ways, it will be, better. I think that some of the big, this, when I think about RH England, RH London, and RH Paris, they might be the three most interesting stores we've ever opened and exciting stores we've ever opened, you know, galleries we've ever opened. I mean, they're so different, but so unique. And, and when I say that in comparison to the competition, it's an even greater strategic separation. So, um, like, I, I go back and forth, you know, which ones I, you know, like the most. Like, right now, you know, it's have to say, you know, England and Paris, you know, and London are just incredible, you know, and all very, very different. Um, but 
spectacular. I, I don't think we could have found anything better for Paris. I mean, I, I really don't. I, I think it's perfectly placed. It's, you know, you have the world of luxury surrounding us. We're, you know, within two blocks, the top executives from many of the top luxury brands in the world, they're going to probably come to lunch at our gallery. Um, yeah, they'll probably go up to the rooftop and have a glass of champagne and have some caviar and look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, there's going to be, you know, some of the, yeah, I, I shouldn't, yeah, I can't say what I was going to say. You know, yeah, you know what I was going to say about who, yeah, I got it. No, no, but <laughs> it's, but the people that are talking about us in the, you know, in Oxfordshire, they know we're coming, you know, like it's exactly the people that you, you know, you, you want talking about. Like, it's funny. I mean, in Oxfordshire, people are asking, you know, what are, what are they doing there? Is it a private club? Can I, how do I get on the list to be a member? You know, like, it's like, it's really interesting. Like the kind of questions we're getting, you know, through sources. So, um, but, but yeah, we'll have design services. Um, initially, they'll be free unless we change our mind between now and then. Um, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but I always say we, we always reserve the right to change our mind for a better idea and, you know, better thinking. So, Right, right now, I don't, I don't think so. But, but I will say, long term, you know, you know, you can think about our brand as evolving to have, you know, you know, just like you think about couture upholstery, bespoke furniture, other things. You know, who knows? Maybe long term, there could be, you know, RH bespoke interior design. You know, like a whole nother level that we charge for. That's, you know, you know, yeah. As we continue to kind of pull up and elevate up and elevate the brand and evolve the brand, you know, you know, so you know, the good thing in, in, in Europe is again, we, we get to start with fresh eyes and we can ask ourselves like, what about this? What about that? Like we've never had a gallery with a champagne and caviar bar. I don't think we would ever even think of putting a gallery, a champagne and caviar bar in the gallery, except for in Paris, this beautiful little kind of space, you know, the top floor kind of terraces back and it's beautiful, like a jewel box. And we figured out a way to get up to the roof and use the roof. And we got approval to use the roof. And we're going to have this, this spectacular rooftop garden. And from the roof and from the level below where the Champagne Caviar Bar is, you see like two thirds of the Eiffel Tower. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Like, how's that, you know? How does the American company come and get a building like that and all of a sudden you can have a champagne and caviar bar? You know, you you can't call it champagne unless it's from champagne. Champagne's in France, right? Like we're opening a champagne and caviar bar in Paris on a rooftop with views of the Eiffel Tower with a garden rooftop. Like you can't make that stuff up. You know, like it just, you know, sometimes we just think like we're in the right side of, you know, Good fortune. Yeah. It's like, keep, you know, like I just sit there and go like, wow, you, you know, it's going to be incredible. So, uh, but yeah, you know, think, I, I, I think just think about it as you're going to see the new best version of us, right? We will evolve. We will have new and fresh ideas. You know, you'll see the first RH, you know, architecture and design library at, uh, uh, at RH England, you know, we, we had designed one for RH Miami, you know, in a, in a location we're still working on 10 years later, you know, which will be like, if it all comes together, it will be a mind blowing experience. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, cause we're, we're working on a integrated gallery, guest house, beach club and bath house, right on the beach in Miami, you know, if it comes together, you know, it'll, I mean, it's designed, but, you know, we're ready to go. So, you know, but there's, it's, again, there's, it's, there's always going to be new, exciting things that evolve here. Yeah, and, uh, and I think they will all render the brand more valuable. And, you know, someday we may charge for all interior design. Don't know. You know, right now it's working pretty good. You know, doesn't mean we shouldn't change it. We, we, you know, one of our beliefs, you know, we have our values and then we have our beliefs and, uh, you know, our beliefs we call, you know, the RH rules, you know, the rest of the rules. And, uh, you know, and rule number one is vision is everything, you know, and, 
uh, we say vision leads the leader. And, you know, you know, those with vision, you know, are leaders and without a vision are managers arranging and organizing the status quo. And, uh, and we say leaders have to be willing to destroy today's reality to create tomorrow's future. We have to be willing to tear down our very best work to do something exponentially greater and more valuable. And I think we've proven that we do that, right? That's why it's 10 years later in Houston in its moment with the best home store in the world. And we only built another one in Scottsdale and then we left it in the dust, right? And so don't feel bad if you, the team in Houston right now or Scottsdale, we, don't worry, we're, we're working. You know, in Houston, we've got a new location. It's going to be incredible. And, and uh, you know, in Scottsdale, we're working on it. Great. That's, that's awesome to hear. Thank you so much and best of luck for the quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Stephen Zaccone from Citigroup. Your line is open. Great. Um, good afternoon, uh, Gary and Jack. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I had a question on the RH guest house. How do you think about the opportunity there relative to the competitive landscape in the hotel industry? And maybe how do you see the TAM opportunity for guest houses over time? Yeah, good, you know, good question. I think what we're, what we're trying to do is to create a, a new market, right, for travelers seeking privacy and luxury. And I tell people that we, we believe privacy is going to become a very important thing and it's going to become a real market, uh, you know, that people are going to, you know, I, I think, you know, privacy is the one thing everybody's given away with social media. And it's one thing that the Internet's taken away because you can Google anything about everybody. Right. So there's a there's a whole level of privacy that that the world has lost. And I think that, uh, you yeah, know, there's just going to be a, you know, a desire to find your place. Right. To, uh, you know, be in that place that's special to you, that, you know, gives you that level of privacy and exclusivity and um and level of luxury that you just can't find anywhere else because someone's trying to do, you know, two or 300 rooms or even 50 or a hundred rooms. Like, I, you know, our first two guest houses have nine and 10 rooms. I, we're going to open in New York with nine rooms and a residence like with six rooms, three suites and a residence. And uh, residents mean it's just the top floor. And the idea is Mr. Friedman's residence. And, you know, and he, he will let people stay there when he's not there. And he'll approve, you know, anybody who's going to stay there. So, um, of course, I'd approve all of you on the, who are on the phone. <laughs> good to, <laughs> not good to know. Cheap. Thank you very much. Good to know. Thank you. Okay. It's not going to be cheap. But, but, um, but, but anyway, it's, it's uh, you know, we're going to open the smallest hotel, I'd say, in, in the biggest city in the, you know, one of the biggest cities in the world. And it's going to be like nothing you've ever seen. You know, there's things that no one's ever done, you know, in hospitality that you're going to see in our guest house. And, uh, you know, and we think it all makes sense. You know, there's just, you know, when we launch it, you know, you'll, you'll hear about it. You'll know what it is. Um, and I think a lot of people will go, like, why hasn't anybody ever done that before? I think a lot of it really makes sense. Um, so we're not trying to be different to be different. We're trying to be better. You know, we're trying to create a new product. Um, yeah, and, and like, at this point, I was so excited about it. I think the, you know, the, the idea of the guest house is, again, first and foremost, to elevate the brand, you know, and position our age as a kind of thought leader, taste and placemaker in the industry. Um, so it's not really what anybody thinks it's going to be. You know, it's, it's just not going to be that. You know, if people ask me, oh, you're opening a hotel, I say, no. They go, what are you doing? I say, guest house. They go, what's the guest house? And I say, we're trying to create a new market for you know, travelers seeking privacy and luxury. And uh, yeah, and then they go, oh, I get it. It's going to be a showroom for your furniture. And I say, 
No, why would we do that? We have a 90,000 square foot showroom 20 steps away. You know, then I say the thing that kind of, you know, kind of it, like this glazed look. I say, in fact, it's not going to have any of our furniture. And then they say, well, whose furniture is it going to have? <clears throat> and they say, it's not really going to have any furniture. It's not about furniture. It's about a completely different experience. You know, it's about a completely integrated, you know, singular design, you know, point of view that no one's ever done before. So, you know, you're just going to see something that you've never seen, you know, and execute it at the highest level of taste and quality and design. And I think, I think it's going to break through. Um, I know we all want to stay there. Uh, and so that usually works, right? You never want to be, you know, the worst thing is when you're in a meeting, you go like, okay, like somebody's presenting some new product, and, you know, there's 30 or 40 people in a meeting and say, okay, how many people here, you know, if, if it wasn't about price, we can afford it. How many people would buy that table? And when all the hands go up or, you know, 70% of the hands go up, you kind of know the odds are that's going to be a winner. When none of the hands go up or a couple of hands go up, he goes, not that. there's not anybody who's seen our guest house, whether it's inside this company or, you know, outside this company, the people working on it, you know, the trades, you know, there, a lot of them said to me personally, like, we know we'll never work on something like this again. This is the best thing we've ever worked on. Like, they're just so proud of it. You know, so, so we're taking it to a level the world's never seen. If you, you want to think about it. You know, this idea of climbing the luxury mountain, when I say, you know, we have to create a forced reconsideration of our brand, you know, that, you know, we're, you know, we're not from the neighborhood, we're not invited to their parties, uh, you know, um, you know, they don't really want us to make that climb. You, you, you have to do work that is so extraordinary and so remarkable that you force the people at the top of the mountain to tip their hat. And I would say, Pick whoever you want in our industry who's at the top of the mountain. You know, I've, I've said his name before, you know, so you probably know who I'm talking about. If he shows up and sees the guest house, he's going to tip his hat. You know, and he just built probably the best hotel in the world that opened this week. So, yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing things to kind of elevate the brand. And by doing, you know, I've always said, you know, one thing that I've learned in my career is when you do extraordinary and remarkable work, uh, you can usually figure out how to monetize it. And that it's really hard to monetize ordinary and unremarkable. You know, so I, I believe, and I think we believe that, that our guest house is extraordinary and remarkable and something that the world has never seen before. And we believe we're going to be able to monetize it, but it's not really in our numbers. Like, you know, we don't, we're not sitting here saying, oh, we should have, you know, we're modeling 50 guest houses or something like that. I think it'll become that, but that's not the idea. You know, the idea is to have a, you know, guest house in New York, have a guest house in Aspen, you know, Miami, Malibu, you know, um, St. Bart's, you know, maybe a few in Europe, uh, and maybe one in Paris, uh, and, uh, you know, London, and, you know, maybe one in Saint Tropez or a few places like that, you know, where, you know, where the wealthy and affluent visit a vacation, um, you know, the Hamptons, things like that. You know, it's like they will have a handful. Um, and my sense is, my sense is right now, New York and Aspen, what we've designed. I think there's a real market. I think people will pay a price that will um, create a new market. I had a really smart person who like, has a ton of success in the hotel industry say, you can never make money in a hotel under 100 rooms. Yeah, I also had a lot of people tell me, you know, that no one is going to go to your Chicago store that's five blocks away from everywhere else. And I had people tell me that, you know, 
nobody does volume in the meatpacking district in New York. You know, that no one makes money in flagship stores in New York. You know, who shops in the meatpacking district? It does, you know, it does, you know, a third of the business of Soho and half the business of Flatiron. You're moving from Flatiron to, to the meatpacking. It's the highest volume home store in all of New York, you know, at the you know mid to high end. Um, I don't know, what do we do in Chicago? 60 million, you know, it, it makes over 20 million a year store it replaced it, you know, 16 million a year in revenue. You know, so like, yeah, we do a lot of things that haven't been done before, but we focus on doing extraordinary and remarkable work. And when we do that, we usually figure out how to monetize it. So, um, you know, Steve, you, you tell me, like, when we open, you know, like, we'll give you a tour, you know, or before we open, you know, like, we'll, we'll, we'll be ready to open. We're, you know, we could open it, you know, in late November, December, if we wanted to. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. I don't want to open in the winter. You know, we've got the most incredible rooftop park with a 40-foot long infinity swimming pool and, you know, private dining terrace that's mind-blowing that has some of the best views in the city. And, um, yeah, I just don't want to open. Everybody's got masks on. It's just weird right now. Like, so, you know, it was easy to say, hey, like, okay, the travertine from Italy is coming in late. You know, we could open in November. What do you think? And I'm just like, yeah, we've waited this long. We'll wait till spring. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll open it, and, and it'll give us more time to practice and get fine tuned and nail the service and nail the restaurant. We've got a whole new restaurant concept there, live fire restaurant the world's never seen. You've never seen anything like this restaurant, and I think we, we have the most beautiful room I've ever stood in from a experience of a restaurant like there's not a bad seat in the house it's so perfectly proportioned um yeah so like we just have a little bit more time to make it better and so, yeah that's what we do so you know we'll leave no doubt um but again i you know like i like to say you can't you can't rush great quality it takes time you know so uh and people will pay more for really great quality. Yeah, I appreciate all that detail. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, look forward to seeing it in person. Yep. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Brad Thomas. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, Gary, I think you alluded earlier to, to being interested in potential acquisitions. Uh, I believe the last one you did was Waterworks in 2016. And I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about, you know, what you learned from that most recent acquisition and, and how you think about what might fit, you know, as an incremental piece of the puzzle here for you. Um, we learned a lot from Waterworks. Um, I think that, yeah, one of the most difficult things uh, you know, challenges like we we work in a very you know integrated way here. You know, we're very visually oriented, and you know, we made an acquisition of a business that was in uh, Connecticut. You know, so that this made it a little, I think, you know, more difficult. You know, you have to kind of you have an idea. You can't just see somebody in the hallway or walk over to where they sit or walk into a room. You know, you know, you can't walk by the product all the time and you know see things and talk with people about ideas and talk about what they're excited about. So, you know, so you think that that's made it different. I think, um, I think over time, you know, we, we've got to all got to know each other better. Like we, you know, we said initially, you know, rule number one, don't screw it up. It's the best brand in the space. It wasn't exactly, we weren't really ready to buy it when we bought it, but it's like those things that come along, you know, once in a lifetime when it's for sale, you know, if you don't buy it, you may never see it again. You know, so um, so we always admired it. It was actually one of two things on our list. The only two things on our list for the first 15 years of our existence here. You know, and uh, 
you know, the other one got screwed up. It was Dean and DeLuca, you know, and it got screwed up and uh, stuff. But we thought we could do something really great with Dean and DeLuca. And who knows, maybe we still will. It went bankrupt. Maybe we'll bring it back to life. Actually put that on the list, guys. No. <laughs> 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 but, um, but, uh, but, but, you know, Waterworks, I think, is, is going to, you know, fit perfectly into where we're going. Because, you know, Waterworks has always been kind of the admired, desired brand. And, you know, so we've learned a lot watching how they run their business and, you know, you know how they think about their brand. And um, so there's, I think we've learned a lot from, from Peter and Ralph and the team. And I think they've learned a lot from us. And I think there's a lot of respect on both sides. And, um, and I think we have really a great shared vision for the future. And, you know, a lot of pieces are coming together that I would say, I mean, I think a lot's going to transpire over the next just year. I mean, I think we're really close to a lot of things. Um, you know, we could be sitting here six months from now, 12 months from now, and be talking about a lot of new, very exciting things that help catapult us up the mountain and how it'll all integrate and come together. So, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so it's, and, and, and the water business, now, like I think people know that, you know, we struggled with in the beginning financially. We, you know, had a write off, you know, most of its book value and, uh, and now it's performing really well. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I, and I think not just because of COVID, I think just because of, you know, just learning from each other, you know, and, uh, um, you know, some things we do really well that they learn from us and some things that they do well, we learn from them, you know, at the higher end and, uh, of the market, and uh, and I think you know they're you know they're going to have a record year, not by a little, you know, probably by you know fifty or sixty percent better than the best year they've ever had in their history at their peak. Uh, and 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 I think uh, you know I think it's on the right trajectory strategically. You know, even if I COVID adjust it, it's 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 the best numbers they've ever had. Uh, you know, that's how we think about things, by the way, you know, internally here. We know there's COVID tailwind. You know, we don't, you know, I don't mean to sound, you know, like, like, gosh, we think this is just going to be here forever. I mean, I think that one of the great things about if there is ever, you know, when it, I just think it's going to be a much softer landing and, you know, uh, than I thought and much longer kind of tail to this thing. And I think for us, what I like is, you know, as it evolves, you know, as things might evolve, you know, from COVID, I think we're going to go into the biggest innovation cycle in the history of the company, and we just might outperform everybody, you know, even if, uh, you know, there's there's some slowdown or give back sometime in the future. So, um, but, uh, you know, I think the same thing's happened with Waterworks. I think the opportunity for Waterworks looks so much bigger now than it ever looked, you know, five years ago. Uh, so, um, and I think all the pieces of the puzzle, you know, they're going to fit together beautifully. Great. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Seth Basham from Red Bull. Your line is open. Thanks a lot. Good evening. It's Seth Basham. appreciate you taking my question. Um, my question is a little bit more about Europe and just the roadmap in terms of the operations and infrastructure to support as much as $250 million in sales in the first year. Can you give us a little bit more color on how that's coming along and what the building blocks are there? Yeah, I mean, the key, you know, building blocks for us are, you know, start with demand creation and how are you going to create demand. So we, we believe we've got the right, you know, initial real estate building blocks and, uh, you know, and the ability to web, launch a website. And, you know, we're, we're learning and, you know, you know, going through optionality and, and, you know, thinking about how to market the brand outside of the physical, you know, mo most of our marketing in the U S is, is kind of physical marketing. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, print 
and tiny bit digital. I, I think we're going to be doing more things. Uh, you know, we've got some really good ideas, and especially as we are evolving the world of RH, uh, you know, and that exercise is um, open our eyes to some really, really, really good ideas, you know, where we can shoot with the rifle and not with the shotgun. Um, so, um, and, you know, and, and those things will, you know, will be the pieces. Like first, you know, you got to think about how do I create demand? And, and that's, you know, that's a big part of the focus. And then we say, now, how do we fill demand? And, and if we're, if we say, hey, if it could be between 50 and 250 million, you know, what risk do you have to take? You know, well, how do you structure the distribution, uh, you know, platform, home delivery platform, uh, you know, small package platform? How do you handle returns? And damages, so you have to have a reverse logistics and outlet platform, um, and that, that's the major pieces, really. Did I forget anything? I mean, those are the pieces of the puzzle that you know we've got to put together. And so, you know, so, you know, the question is, you know, how do you, you know, you 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 hate to kind of say like, boom, you launch this thing, and it's like people come, you know, driving in from Spain and France and the Netherlands and every, you know, drive, they come train in or fly into England and shop at our gallery and, um, and they want to, like, look, today we have people that buy from us from Europe and arrange to have their own goods shipped. Well, I think they're going to do that a lot more in the UK. Now, we may not be ready yet with the reverse, reverse logistics and other things to handle returns and, and stuff like that. So, you know, we're going to start kind of country by country, see what we learn, you know, maybe open up a country. You know, I, you know, I, I don't want the first impression to be a reverse logistics outlet store, you know, that's the first physical experience for our age, you know, not, you know, that I, I you know, it's just not the right first experience. It's, it's a important part of our business, uh, you know. And and uh, yeah, you know, But you, you don't want to kind of go out there and launch a web business and just your only physical experience in in many countries is is a reverse logistics outlet store. I, I think that's not how you build a great luxury brand. So you know, we're going to build incredible physical experiences. We'll have. We'll be launching with the new world of RH, um, you know, uh, digital uh, uh, portal and, you know, web, web experience, which is all new, you know, all simplified, all really user friendly, you know, great navigation, all kinds of, you know, great functionality. Uh, and then we, we really have to execute well. Like now, here's the good news. They sell furniture in Europe and they deliver it to people's homes. So it's not something that's not done. <laughs> so we know that's done. It's done every day. Um, you know, we have to be able to execute it really well. So, you know, how are we going to do that with third parties we've never worked with before? You know, even though there are third parties in, in, uh, in Europe that we've worked with in the United States, same, same company, but, you know, it's your European division and whatnot. And, you know, there's going to work to get to know people. We're going to have to make sure they understand our standards and what we expect. But we, we've got to, I think, we really have an incredible leadership team, uh, you know, in that part of the business. And, um, you know, they're super passionate about this. I mean, they, you know, they're ready to go. You know, they want to, like, get going. So, um you know, and, and we've got people, you know, now, you know, transitioning base there. And, like, you know, so, I, you know, I, I think I don't see any parts of the business that I think, you know, that, you know, that I don't think we can execute really well with the team we have. It's just more preparing for the unknown. It's preparing for that range, you know, preparing for 50 to 250 million. I, you know, maybe it'll be right in the middle. It'll be 125 the first year. Um, yeah, 
I don't think it's going to be 400 million the first year, and I don't think it's going to be 10 million the first year. You know, so I think the range is right. It's just a really big range. And so, you know, if it's 50, you know, is there a little bit more earnings drag? Sure, there is. Uh, but you've got to be able to take those kind of risks, right? We can't. We're not going to get it fine-tuned perfectly. Um, uh, so, but when we know more, you know, we'll. Yeah, we'll share it with you. Thanks. And just a follow-up modeling question for Jack. In terms of the operating margin outlook for the balance of the year, could you give some color on how to think about gross margin versus SG&A? <laughs> um, we're not we're not guiding at that level. I think at the, at the moment we're just we're, you know we'll, we'll leave it at the operating income margin. I think you've seen what we've delivered. Um, in terms of uh, you know gross margin and SG&A uh, you know variances versus last year versus the last two years we talked about um, and, and you know clearly there's been you know as you look at the SG&A uh, difference you know there's been timing and differences of advertising that's been one of the biggest drivers so I mean I think we made comments about that last quarter and uh, you know and then we noticed uh, you know what, what what our plans are with, uh, with, with the change in the books this year so just just keep that in mind. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Your last question comes from the line of Christina Fernandez from Telsey Advisory Group. Your line is open. Hey, good evening, and thank you for taking my question. I wanted to ask on supply chain, um, on, on DNM particularly, can you comment on how much of your product is sourced uh, from the country and um, do you expect any sort of product categories to be impacted by the manufacturing delays, um, you know, the shutdown going on right now? Thank you. How much product is sourced from, from Vietnam, you said? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Correct. Yeah, how much product is sourced and then, um, yeah. you know, a total yeah. income comes from the product. I think we've we disclosed. I think we've disclosed in the past the amount in Asia, right? I don't know if we do it specifically by broken country. We broke into China. You know, yeah, broken out China. Asia. Yeah, I mean, we we have a meaningful, you know, part of our business in Vietnam. Uh, you know, and more business has migrated to Vietnam with the tariff situation in China. Um, Viet, Vietnam makes really high. You know, had some small boutique, high quality factories that we got involved with got here in 2008, 9, 10, 8, 9, 10. You know, people that we've grown with that were maybe, you know, $3 million to $5 million, and now, you know, we're 50 to $120 million of volume with them, you know, first cost. So we've got great relationships in Vietnam. Uh, you know, it's, it's a meaningful production. Uh, you know, especially when you think about, you, you know, you can't really buy wood furniture in China for bedroom, right? You, 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 you pay crazy tariffs, it's exponential, right? So it's, they make it impossible to buy bedrooms. There's anti dubbing and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, so there's no bedroom coming out of China. So that's always been heavier, you know, in Vietnam and Indonesia and other, other countries and, um, uh, yeah, you know, but yeah, it's meaningful, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's you know caused us to you know push the launch of contemporary and and hold on um, our other books because it's it's a meaningful part of the newness. Understood. Is it also a meaningful part of the core business? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, anything that's meaningful is meaningful to the core. The yeah. core is almost the whole business here. Yeah. Okay. And then my follow-up question, would you be able to kind of quantify or comment how much of the delay in RH Contemporary and I assume the guest house and the digital are smaller, but how much of the revenues shifted out of 2021 into 2022? Um, I. It's all in our guidance, right, for this year. We're not we're not um, guiding 22 yet, but it it was supposed to first launch in spring, then it's going to launch in fall. Now it's launching, you know, next spring. So it wasn't zero. 
All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There are no other questions on queue. I will now turn the call over back to Gary for any closing remarks. Great. Well, thank, thank you, everyone, for your, for your interest. And, you know, thank you for our team, uh, you know, who is kind of leading the charge and, uh, you know, bringing our vision and values to life. Uh, we, we could not be more proud of the work that everybody's doing and the effort that everybody's put through. And, and again, you know, we, we feel, you know, super blessed and fortunate to be in the position we're in and our hearts go out to, you know, not only the people that are, that are suffering in Vietnam, but, you know, just suffering all over the world, you know, through this COVID, you know, this COVID and, and the variants that are, you know, continuing to wreak havoc and, and uh, um, you know, and even right here in America and, you know, and even, on a, you know, a, a much smaller scale, you know, people who suffered just recently here through the, the hurricanes and the devastation, you know, so, um, you know, so it's, it's been, you know, it's hard to feel, yeah, you know, so good about your business when so many people are, are suffering. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but, but, you know, we've never been more excited and, and we, you know, we, we've said, you know, this is the time to have a lot of edge and a lot of empathy. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, just really thank everyone and also just send out, you know, our, our very best wishes to the, to the people, you know, and, uh, you know, that are, that are struggling through these times. Um, and to our people, you know, just thank you for, you know, making this, this company more exciting, more innovative, more magical than at any other time, you know, that, it, you know, in our history. Um, and I think we're going to rewrite history as we go forward. So, uh, great job, everyone. Thank you. Okay. That's it, thank operator. You. Operator. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect.